Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to today's ISC Squared Security Briefing. Today is part one in a three-part series brought to us by BitGlass. And today we're going to be talking about the evolution of CASBs or cloud access security brokers. Many of you have probably run into these in your own uh, enterprises or exploring an option to include them in your cloud strategy. And today we're joined by Amish Kohli, who's the solutions engineer from BitGlass, who's going to be riffing on an old Star Wars theme here with CASBs A New Hope and talking a little bit about how these uh, solutions can be a more mature uh, component of your ongoing strategy in information security. And we'll continue to explore uh, various facets of this over the next two iterations of this briefing series as well. I noticed a few of you have already taken the liberty of bouncing over to the attachments and links section. We will have a copy of the slides there in PDF format, as well as some additional links for additional materials for you and opportunities for you there to sign up for the part two and part three. If you've got your calendars handy, now would be a great time uh, to go ahead and, uh, and tick those off. So Amish, without uh, further ado, I want to pass the baton over to you folks. I'm going to fade into the background here and be looking for those questions. Feel free to throw those out as he's talking today, and we'll take time for that Q&A at the end. So over to you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, Mike. Again, my name is Amish Kohli. I'm a senior solutions engineer here at BitGlass. And I'm just going to begin the presentation off by talking a little bit about uh, the theme. Uh, CASB is a new hope, as was reiterated, uh, a little spoof on the Star Wars-based theme, but really talking about how CASBs have evolved and what we're looking at today as far as uh, 2016 going forward on how CASBs can help solve any security gaps or solutions that you're using within cloud environments. So, you know, the, the typical theme is you always start a long time ago in a CISO's old security strategy like it does in Star Wars, uh, just explaining a little bit about, you know, what CASBs do, right? So, essentially, in particular to uh, cloud access security brokers, the interest is in securing the data across any cloud application. So, you know, there's other traditional methods of securing devices, but in terms of actually accessing cloud information outside your perimeter, you end up losing a lot of uh, visibility and access and security to your data. So, essentially, enterprise CASBs are really looking into visibility analytics of what your end users are doing in your cloud sanctioned applications, uh, data protection. Right uh, for, for information going up and down to the cloud. Um, and then identity and access control now really honing in on and in allowing you to disallow or allow access based on various factors. Because let's face it, in today's environment, the cloud in general, they, the idea is to empower the end user, right? being you, given the ability that, to access your content from anywhere at any time. What scares security professionals are, the actual ability for the end user to do that. And so coming across or using a CASB can actually tighten that back and give you now the control over those applications. Today's world, when you talk about the traditional app vendor, what they're more interested in doing is actually securing the, ac the application level or the storage level or really the servers in the network. So let's try and segment and separate data from actual um, infrastructure. So moving forward, right, let's talk about in terms of Star Wars. You know, you first had the Clone Wars, right, uh, kind of a, a newer um, faction, if you may, the, the Empire starting to begin, right, and so we like to give a little spoof. In the beginning, before the Republic was sabotaged by the Empire, what that really means is shadow IT was all we knew. And so when a lot of people think of CASBs or Cloud Access Security Brokers, the first thing that comes to mind is shadow IT. Now, what really is shadow IT? It's more of giving the ability to see where your end users are going to the cloud, right? And so it, it gives a blueprint and visibility into what is actually happening within your perimeter. And now, now when, when, when this first happened, just like the Republic was kind of curious where this faction was coming from and what was it all about, that was the blueprint model. That was exactly what, how it started being a cloud access security broker. So let's look at it more of a management and visibility versus actual security. 
And so as, as we continue on with the presentation, you'll see how we evolved. But more importantly, shadow IT still is an important piece of securing cloud applications. But at this moment, at this point in time, it was more of a blueprint focus. Now, what is shadow IT, right? Some people on the phone, I want to you know, make sure that we're able to explain a little bit about what it is, right, before kind of blowing past it and showing a little bit more. Really what it's doing is to gain visibility in your org's cloud usage. So as you see here, you know, Big Glass also supports this type of action. We give a little bit different spin on the fact that, you know, we're doing more of a breach discovery as well because, let's face it, there may already be malicious attackers or some type of activity within the cloud environment today or within your internal network. We can also snuff out the ability of what sources are actually connecting to malicious destinations or vice versa, and showing data that's actually being infiltrated and exfiltrated through your network. And so understanding the risk profiles of frequently used apps also helps us with the ability of presenting to you what is an anonymizer, what, what folks are accessing Tor nodes unbeknownst to them, right? And so when we say in this bullet, intelligent time-saving alerts out of the box, what that really is, it, it gives you some control back of now understanding where your data might be traveling, and if there is any type of unsanctioned activity, Shadow IT gives you huge visibility on that. So hopefully also we can show you in this diagram how folks are going to like Tor, Tor node routers, Onion routers, or even maybe applications that you guys are sanctioning, but in the past have been known to have some malicious or suspicious activity going to and from those applications. Okay. Now, as we move along in the Star Wars theme, let's talk about the API-based approach. So I bring this up as Revenge of the Sith. Now the Empire itself began growing powerful with their management of security approach, right? So now that we know where folks are going to, we want to now give more security and control of those applications with your content, okay? So the translation is organizations are limited a little bit with API security. So as, as the growth of CASBs are coming along and they're presenting new ways to secure cloud applications, you'll find that sometimes APIs have a limited base approach, okay? And I'll explain a little bit more what I'm, what I'm referring to. Now, what an API is, it allows CASB solutions to scour and scan um, files at rest, or content at rest, I should say, within enterprise SaaS applications, such as uh, OneDrive for Business, Google, Slack, uh, Dropbox, all enterprise-based applications where you folks, security folks, are trusting your content to go to, APIs are non-user intrusive and can actually now apply management and security within them. So what, is, what exactly is API control, right? So we always talk about visibility from Shadow IT. So not only are you getting visibility as well with an API within the application, you can now invoke security. So security can come in the form of DLP, data loss prevention where uh, particularly in Big Glass, there is also al already a native engine built into the solution. And so based on standard keyword and regu regular expressions, we are able to match uh, content and then invoke policies such as quarantining files. Um, a lot of folks are, are curious and want to know uh, what files are being shared with outside-based uh, third parties, right? So being able to control sharing rights and access or giving a blueprint value of who's sharing what with whom, maybe what group they're a part of, and what files are actually being shared within the organization and outside of the organization. In addition to that, being able to watermark or redact or encrypt content within the files themselves, right? So non-user intrusive approach, end users are, are uploading and downloading content to these cloud-sanctioned applications but now because of an API being invoked, you're able to place watermarks in a file, for example. And with BitGlass, you'll be able to track those files if they are exfiltrated out of that solution and sent out into the wild outside of your control and corporate network. In addition, 
being able to really take a proactive approach beyond quarantining, which is more of a blocking-based content. You can encrypt files at rest, um, which comes in handy because if there is some editing, right, and the editing uh, becomes valid before the API scan, uh, then at that time of the scan, you can encrypt files if there is some type of content you don't want getting outside of the cloud. Now, the one thing we were talking about going back, I just want to go back one reference to this t title slide, is you know orgs are limited with limited API security, right? So what do we mean by that? Now, the API approach is really a great way of securing and managing content in the cloud, but at the same time, there are limitations that the clouds allow. So with these APIs, uh, any CASB, not just Big Class, are really limited to the allotment of calls that those applications grant them. So scans may take place every five seconds or ten or one minute or five minutes, right? So there is a small gap within the environment with APIs. Now that being said, there is quite a bit of advantage being able to use the API-based approach to secure your cloud applications, but just understand that it is not a pure real-time approach in securing data um, within the cloud environment, right? Because at times, as I mentioned before, based on the limited availability of those calls, there can be some gaps at that point. Okay. So Essentially, let's, let's, let's segue a little bit and talk a little bit about you know, Office 365 and their native DLP because I had mentioned before that we have built-in DLPR solution whether it's with files at rest or actually files in transit which I'll explain in a bit. But with native DLP, essentially there's also a, a, a BYOD blind spot, right? So basically the uh, native O365 DLP is not geared uh, towards protecting data on, on a BYOD-based device, okay? So it's difficult for them on an unmanaged-based asset to protect uh, content going to and from the cloud. Um, the, the operational overhead, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not one of those folks that sit here and say, okay, this is bad or this is good based on competitive factors. Uh, all I try to do is to do a little more explanation on what is the approach that current applications are doing today. So. BitGlass has a native DLP built in. Microsoft actually already has an established DLP, but that DLP essentially is more for outbound or send-based activity, right? It's not meant to, to invoke coming down to any endpoint. Now, so when we talk about overhead and deployment, right, there is some integration efforts that are required uh, based on certain versions or certain devices, right? So it's not always easy to deploy that type of security on every single type of device and or um, application. Uh, of course, there is a licensing fee, right? Of course, there's an uptick charge for every little thing sometimes that these larger applications support. So, you know, if you want this, you have to, you know, pay this much licensing cost, uh, et cetera. And then, you know, let's talk about really what point solution means. If it's O365, it only is going to support Office 365 applications. And in this world today, you know, your enterprises are using multiple cloud factions such as Salesforce, O365, Dropbox, a little bit that I mentioned before. So when you talk about point solutions, there may only be DLP for their activity. So even if you go ahead and roll that out, beyond the operational overhead or deployment difficulties, you'll find that, hey, that's just for one application. What about application B, C, D, et cetera, right? So just understanding that, you know, with the cloud and as more folks are empowering the cloud and using the cloud, it has to be thought of for every single cloud application. How are you going to protect data with real-time data loss prevention? So just kind of showing an example of how this in Microsoft's terms, doesn't always work across all applications, and there can be some challenges. So let's, you know, move on to the focus of the theme that we want to have, a new hope, right? So as you guys know, within the Star Wars environment, for those of you who maybe do not know uh, about Star Wars, which I would be surprised, but that's okay. I have actually come across some folks that have not seen any of the movies. So A New Hope represents 
uh, a, not really just a new life or a new opportunity. What we're actually trying to convey is that there is a balance in how you're able to secure cloud applications, right? It, it is not with just shadow IT. It is not just API. It is also with API and inline security, which Big Glass definitely will provide. Now, just talking back to the Star Wars theme, right, it, it, the Rebels really uh, were defeated, and they emerged with a new way to secure SaaS applications with an agentless inline approach, right? So the old Republic or Empire methods were still used to maintain balance in the force. So let's explain a little bit of what that means, right? So today you'll find that, you know, a lot of CASBs are using shadow IT um, and APIs to secure, which is, is, again, it's a good way of doing it, but it becomes more of a management-based security. We feel that the only real way to secure applications is going to be a mixture of API and inline. So when we talk about inline, we are talking about reverse proxy-based architecture, which I'll explain in a bit, and more importantly, agentless right, not having to distribute agents on managed assets, really allowing true BYO for unmanaged assets, but giving you now not just security where you're saying, okay, deny access on unmanaged devices. That could cause some type of a, uh, end user uproar, but also give secure access to those folks on unmanaged accounts and then still be able to secure and have visibility, right? So a new hope being that there is now a way to have foolproof security for SaaS applications. So how CASB security works, and in particular, you know, since you know, I do work here at BitGlass, how BitGlass CASB security works, right? So we'll have a reverse proxy architecture for unmanaged device controls without agents. And, and you know, what we're doing is basically, you know, the secret sauce is uh, being able to secure that traffic to and from the application without an agent involved. And like I mentioned before, a lot of folks are, are using reverse proxy, but that's more of a, of a direct or deny approach, which could be fine, right? They want to say uh, unmanaged devices, just send people directly to the application and we'll secure traffic, um, sorry, not traffic, we'll secure content via an API security, which again, it could be fine, but you're limited to the gaps of that API security. So beyond giving a direct or deny, right, maybe then it would be deny access altogether, which could cause some end user grumbling saying, hey, how come I can't access my OneDrive when I'm on vacation in Hawaii? I may, might have to do some activity, right? So BitGlass in particular with their reverse proxy now allows access and gives the ability to secure that traffic going to and from the cloud with no software, no agents. So the uniqueness is the end user still has a seamless experience, but the administrators of the solutions still get visibility, control, and security to those applications, right? So a reverse proxy makes it simple. It's not doing a, um, uh, uh, a proxying of all traffic, like maybe a forward proxy does, which I'll get into. And it just makes life for the end user a lot more easier as well. Now with forward proxies, you're looking at more managed device controls, right? Being able to, you know, uh, have some type of managed access on a, on a device given or distributed by the organization, right? Subject to different rules. So you'll find that, you know, working with BitGlass, we will provide really detailed use case requirements talking about, okay, managed assets have certain rights and privileges and security, else unmanaged assets, again, maybe not denied, but are subject to different rights, access, and security. So forward proxies are more meant for managed assets where you can see what might be going on on distributed clients. And finally, the most unique thing that BitGlass does offer in really filling the final security gap is active sync traffic. So let's talk Office 365 right now. As they're you know, asking people to move to the cloud from an exchange environment or really saying, hey, we're going to end of life exchange. I'm sure some of you have come across these conversations with your uh, account executives. Um, with the active sync security, we are actually now filling in a gap of BYO. Because let's face it, on mobile devices, you know, uh, folks do want their email. But at the same time, they do not want their organizations looking into their pictures or their Facebook, et cetera. So 
with an agentless active sync approach, Big Glass can now secure email contacts and calendars on any mobile device, completely agnostic, right? Any client, any device that supports active sync, Big Glass will support. And then not only are we able to give agentless approach of a, a, a seamless based opportunity because, of course, as you know, there are some agent-based device security models such as MDMs. Big Class is not really trying to follow suit of the MDM. Big Class is more interested in securing the data coming down to the device. So we can provide inline security such as selectively wiping just email contacts and calendars without an agent on that device being able to invoke device encryption if needed, and then also kind of that first line of defense invoking a pin code enforcement. So with CASB security in particular with us, as you're seeing on this uh, architecture diagram, there's really different ways to secure but really lock down all that security so there is no gaps. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a good blueprint of how Big Glass is approaching it. And then again, you know, what are some unique differentiators of us compared to, let's say, other CASB models? Okay. So continuing on, um, let's talk about a data-centric approach because essentially that's, that's what it is. It's, it's wanting to secure the data. Uh, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record all the time, but I'll keep mentioning that the cloud is there to empower the users, right? The idea is not to prevent them from having access to access their content, your content, I should say, from any device, right? So cloud data doesn't only exist in the cloud, right? And that's why, you know, we want to make sure that it's a purely data-centric approach. Uh, that includes granular DLP, right, being more proactive. So before files or content get down to a device, whether it's a managed or an unmanaged asset, you want to make sure that it's either stops in its tracks or alerting somebody or encrypting a file but maybe taking more of a proactive approach versus a reactive approach which says, okay, um, the file was already scanned and shared or the file was already downloaded, right? Then at that point it doesn't make much sense because it's already getting got out of the perimeter. Now, another thing is uh, context aware to be to distinguish between users, device type, and more. So visibility, right? Giving the, uh, the access since you are in line to talk about what devices users are using gives you a little bit more flexibility to understand how users are accessing the content, okay? And, and it shows you, okay, more of our users are utilizing Box on their desktop, right? So maybe we should deny the mobile application for certain users outside the perimeter, right? So like very granular-based control, but concentrating on the data and where it actually flows. And then finally, device controls on mobile. So we talked a little bit about you know, allowing denying access uh, for client applications. Um, of course, with Active Sync, you can do selective wipe, and then pin code enforcement um, for maybe devices that are allowed certain access. So, a lot of flexibility, but centering around the data itself. I'll continue on here. I'll <clears throat> make sure we talk a little bit about you know how cloud and mobile are inseparable, right? So that's a big part of cloud. Uh, you know, empowering the users, having the ability to access content on the device, any device, particularly mobile devices, right? So in general, the audience that I'm speaking to, whether it's IT, security folks, um, there must be, you know, you, you must enable secure access to cloud apps from any device, right? Because, you know, the, the ability for an end user to, to download that on BYO, right, gives them the ability to access the content. So. BYOD does pose a threat to data security, essentially due to a lack of visibility and control after the download, right? So being able to understand how the data is flowing and then invoking a CASB solution to secure that is really important uh, within the mobile security environment. And then finally, CASBs accommodate user BYOD demands, right? Because you guys may have heard this a lot, I want this application or that application or let's face it, even I want email on my device, right? So, you know, half the audience may still say that we don't give BYO access. We distribute a, a mobile device with a, maybe a managed type of MDM or agent on there, and that's the only way you can receive email. But, you know, users are always going to want to be um, pushing the limit, pushing the edge, and it's not a bad thing, right? I mean, I think having the ability to access data on their own devices is where not only I think we're headed 
later, but it's coming now, or it is here today. So, you know, the audience could be mixed on how they want to approach BYO, but the bottom line is BYO is the future. And, you know, really having folks uh, have the flexibility to work on their own devices and access your content is what is going to happen and what the future will be, right? So the new hope of, of all uh, encompassing security on those applications is what we're trying to also protect as well. <clears throat> so CASB identity, right? So identity management is key in securing data. So what are we talking about here, right? So uh, a big way that we're actually able to do a reverse proxy architecture is to piggyback off uh, single sign-on solutions or identity providers, uh, SAML providers such as uh, Okta, Ping, ADFS, just naming a few, right? That makes it more seamless for us, Big Glass in particular, to be able to give the user the complete native experience, right? So. Uh, in addition, just wanted to throw out there, if no one's using an IDP, BitGlass can actually also support being an IDP. So if that's not one is in place for your SaaS applications, BitGlass can support the identity provider role. But that being said, CASI do offer integrated identity management across applications, right? It gives, again, more security to say, hey, uh, John is you know, logging in uh, from San Francisco to his Salesforce. But yet, 30 minutes later, uh, John's account was also logged in from New York, and we know that's physically impossible. Now that since we are able to be in the quote path and access these um, access the traffic to invoke the policy, now you can say, well, because that second attempt was made, that second attempt has to have a multi-factor authentication. So, uh, step-up based authentication it doesn't have to be multi-factor. It could be a timeout where you would have to re-authenticate. But now CASBs are able to give more security uh, via identity management, right? And so for high-risk logins or usage, because once again, the cloud is empowering the users to use the applications from anywhere, right? So giving you a little bit more peace of mind of putting in identity management security um, is going to be something that, that you'll have to think about. And particularly, CASBs can solve that. Other things can be timeout sessions, right? Uh, we talked about heuristics or your Weba, um, you know, uh, understanding, you know, if users are uh, downloading or uploading a, a larger subset of data, maybe in the gigabytes, et cetera, based on um, uh, kind of common factors that they're doing, you know, maybe someone's downloading one to two megabytes per week. All of a sudden, they they upload or download a larger, you know, uh, um, content payload of one gig that can maybe reauthenticate that user or alert, you know, some type of administrator to understand that. So, you know, it's going to be very important when, as you do uh, distribute your cloud applications uh, to really have more control from the identity management piece. So something to think about and something CASBs can really help with as well. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk a little bit about some um, K. K uh, hold on for a second. Case studies. Uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some case studies here of, of our current customers that we have here at Big Glass. So uh, there is one Fortune 50 healthcare firm, right? They're, they had some challenges, right? Because the native O365 security really wasn't cutting. Um, what, is it, what they needed as far as guidelines for security. And so they wanted to bring in a, a CASB, and particularly we, they went with BitGlass because really largely it was to protect uh, content coming down on unmanaged devices or securing content coming down uh, um, from unmanaged devices as well, right? So also with a, a current perimeter-based you know, uh, SWG, like a blue coat, what do you do when they're outside your perimeter, right? And so they understood that. Um, you know, the challenge also is limiting external sharing, right? So as they wanted to move to OneDrive, they had a challenge saying, how do we not allow our users to share everything with certain vendors or people, or if it has maybe some PHI or PII type guidelines within those documents. So we provided a solution with the real-time visibility and control, right? It was an inline approach. They actually, so I wanted to let you know that BitGlass can also support ICAP enabled DLP. 
So we are also able to um, secure via your own DLP because we understand that there are already legacy or um, current DLP solutions in house. So if the flexibility needs to be, we we've already purchased a DLP. We can over ICAP call your same DLP based patterns to invoke policy. But in this case, this firm realized that you know the engine is built in. It's going to be easy and more native for our users. So they've decided to utilize our DLP, and they use it quite well for policy and upload or download, right, based on certain keyword or regex, as I explained. Essentially, you know, they wanted to make sure that they are quarantining externally changed, shared sensitive files in the cloud. So limit external sharing, we've said, okay, if there is some type of files that are sitting at rest that have um, uh, pattern match content, that you know you can quarantine those, and quarantine just doesn't mean make unavailable, right? You can pass those files on to an administrator to actually inspect, and then if they need to, they can whitelist those type of uh, that type of content. More important, most important, I think, was controlled unmanaged device access, and that was the real key. How do we either prevent or secure users on unmanaged assets accessing our content? Okay, and then finally, actually, you know, they utilize BitGlass for for shadow IT and breach, right? Because Again, it's an important part of uh, CASBs to again show what the blueprint is and see where people are going before you invoke any kind of policy or security around it. So it was quite a successful deployment. As you can see, it was a large number of employees that we deployed, and they're quite happy with using us as a CASB. Uh, another uh, business giant, data giant, um, use, utilizes BitGlass. Uh, in more than 15,000 employees, this is a global deployment. So I wanted to also add that BitClass is uh, globally distributed through AWS, right? We find that their compliance and their standards are of the highest grade, and so we want to be a part of that in maintaining uptime and availability, so we globally distribute through AWS as well. And we find that most of our customer base is quite satisfied because of the policies and compliances and, and I guess, regulations that they will support for their vertical. So their challenge in, in was Google Apps, right? They, well, they rolled out Google Apps. You know, they wanted to mitigate the risk of the adoption. Uh, more importantly, they didn't want sensitive data being from being stored in the cloud. And so what do, what do we mean by that? Uh, not all their, they don't want all their data going into the cloud. They understand that Google is safe and effective, like we talked about before, that applications have their own security, but it's not more of a prevention security, right? Of course, things are encrypted at rest, but we also want to be able to make sure that certain content doesn't get into that cloud application. And so BitClass could support that use case for them. Um, limit data access based on device risk level, right? So um, if they realize that a certain group of users uh, may have access to certain type of content, you can actually set policy very granularly on that to, to security methods going to and from those applications. And then govern external sharing, which seems to be a very popular theme with our customers. We just really want to you know, not have their content being shared with, with third parties um, outside of their um, cloud applications. And so we provided not only inline protection for unmanaged devices, again, another popular theme, but we also provided data at rest via an API, or security at rest, I should say. Um, Bidirectional DLP, so upload and download from the cloud, which is quite important because you'll find folks that will say, sure, you can uh, create a file and edit it within the cloud application, but we just don't want it coming down to an unmanaged asset or any asset maybe. Uh, in reverse, uploading data to the, con to the cloud like this particular um, customer uh, was a no-no from certain users or certain type of content. And then, of course, real-time sharing control. So, you know, really giving the flexibility back to the customer, and I always have to stress giving the user the native experience because there is no involvement for the user, no software, no agent, nothing to install. They just continue to authenticate and access the cloud as natively um, as it was originally given. Okay. And then, so a little bit about Big Glass. Um, so essentially, you know, we are were established in uh, about a little over almost four years ago. Okay, so we, you know, essentially that's our kind of our motto: total data protection, right? Being able to now protect data going outside of the firewalls, and in particular for sanctioned cloud applications, right? So 
we're, we were very well funded um, by some top tier VCs. Of course, we won you know numerous awards, whether they were security based awards or Gartner based awards. That's under our portfolio. Um, we definitely have quite a bit of customers, and not only just quite a bit of customers, but quite large deployments. So the benefit of BitGlass is you're able to secure the whole organization. So whether it's mobile devices over ActiveSync, inline security, it's a very simple cutover, as we call it, to integrate the whole organization going through BitGlass, right? Cloud distributed, uh, scalable. And as you can see with the amount of users that we're supporting, uh, we have no issues supporting large deployments as well. So very uh, beneficial to large enterprise organizations who really want to take the hassle of securing the cloud through various mechanisms and utilizing a CASB in particular, BitGlass, to kind of secure all their needs uh, throughout those applications. So um, we have been around for some time. We'll continue to be around um, and we've uh, done a successful job doing it along. So if you need some more um, resources, right, um, we do have some white papers and reports available. Um, so, you know, you can contact us uh, after the webinar if you need to. I'm sure some of our folks will be reaching out to you. We have plenty of white papers. The definitive guide to CASB is actually is a good one because that gives an overview of, of what a CASB is, um, of course, we do have cloud adoption by industry in our reports. We have a, that's a very good report as well. I encourage you guys to download and read all these reporting. And then along with the case studies that, we, that we've that we showed you, we can request other case studies as well because we we have a lot of happy customers. And these customers are, are more than willing to talk about, you know, um, how they've used this to secure their solutions and you know how it was beneficial to them. So because everyone has different use cases and requirements when it comes to securing cloud applications. So this is something that would might be beneficial to you reading through some of the case studies that we provide as well. So plenty of resources um, and plenty of activity um, if you need more questions answered. And so uh, we are Big Glass. Um, my name is Amish Kohli again. I'm a solutions engineer here. Um, you will have information provided by the webinar. Um, in the last, I think, uh, few minutes, we wanted to um, take some questions. So um, I believe the moderator is going to field a couple of questions. Um, Absolutely. Perhaps. Most definitely, Amish. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a bunch for giving us, uh, giving us the rundown there. Uh, and, you know, even though this is a three-part series and is uh, based on Star Wars, I don't think we started with four and are going five and six. We're actually going one, two, three with this one. So, um, folks, um, we did have a couple of questions that are kind of housekeeping oriented first off that I'd like to lead off with. Uh, by registering today for this event, you will automatically receive your uh, Group A CPA, CPEs rather, uh, in your account in a few business days. So you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about uh, registering those. Uh, and as an archive, this uh, will be available to you through the same URL. So you can pass this around to your friends and colleagues who couldn't make it today, and they too will receive their CPEs for that. So no sweat, whether it's live or uh, record it, you will receive that credit. So Amish, let's, uh, let's dive into some questions here. Sure. I want, I want to go back to when we were talking about the shift away, you know, from kind of the old way of doing things into this API-based model. And it seems mm -hmm. to me that there's a couple of potential uh, cracks in the armor with the API model, mm -hmm. one of which being that uh, it seems to be your level of granularity and control is dependent on the service provider, not, not mm -hmm. the CASB, but the actual service provider's API quality and what they want to expose. With the explosion of software as a service and tool providers out there and our mm -hmm. user populations adopting sometimes some very cutting edge stuff, um, can you tell us how that is impacting the ecosystem as a whole? Yeah, I mean, you know, people are going to expand and explode, or sorry, they're going to gravitate towards these exploding applications or service providers, right? So, you know, I think it's up to us to understand what those are and what folks are really trying to protect, 
right? I mean, you know, if it's a if it's a security model, it's something that we want to actually go out and help partner or work with those applications. If it's a management or visibility model, um, I think that's a lot easier to give you a blueprint of what's going on, who's sharing what with whom. So I think we're always adding to the library um, of what we're supporting. Um, today I think it's important to really secure or give visibility via an API to the more popular sanctioned applications, like I, the ones I've been kind of name dropping earlier in the in the conversation. But as, as cloud is expanding, I think it's, it, it's up to the CASB to continue to expand to give visibility and security to those applications. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, BitGlass has been around uh, for quite a while now in this space. Um, have you seen an improvement as new services and software products are coming out that are cloud-enabled or cloud-based? Are you seeing in general the state of the art around their APIs? They're launching with more robust and more complete APIs mm -hmm. now than perhaps they did in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, they, they absolutely are, right? And I think the API approach is an important mechanism of doing it. So, you know, they, it is going to be robust, but you're still, there's, there still could be some limited capabilities, right? Nothing is is in line, right? It's, it's a more of a management security approach. So I will say yes, as we move along, those applications are going to provide more, more robust capabilities, but you, there is still going to be a small gap whether you're using 100 cloud applications or one, regardless of the fact there will be some kind of gap in the allotment of scan ability. So I am going to say as we expand on, I'm not going to discredit anything that the, those, those applications or service providers will support, but what we're seeing today, at least for now, if you want real-time security, there has to be a hybrid approach. No, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. As we're uh, we're making our own push into the cloud space here in my organization, and uh, you know, I keep hearing talk about hybrid this, hybrid that, and you know, I think everybody's hybrid to some degree because we're all still in transition. You can't be pure play on really on either side at this point. Um, mm -hmm. You touched on a uh, on a trend though, and it's what's driving a lot of this in my own organization, and that's that concept of any user, any device, anywhere, anytime, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the inseparability of mobility and cloud, are you finding that as technologies such as yours gain adoption in larger enterprises, that the enterprise is, traditional enterprise is being relegated to being more of a, I guess, a, an ISP when you're in the office rather than uh, a traditional service provider and that now organizations are, are taking kind of a, I guess you could say, a different view of where their protection mechanisms sit in that in that chain of connectivity yeah you know I think I think organizations have to also be progressive um, when thinking about you know where their content is going to be and what access uh, their end users have to it so when we talk about like a lockdown environment or an ISP you know it, it's something that you can afford to do but as you'll find that content is going to these outside applications and access from anywhere, you have to have some mechanisms in place. So, you know, the organizations, if they're trying to stick with what they have today, they're going to find out very fast that it's just not a scalable way to manage your content data or secure it. And so I mm -hmm. think it's important for those um, security professionals to have a little bit more progressive approach and get ahead of it versus rolling out things and then saying, oh, no, there is a gap there. How do we secure it? No, good advice. I think uh, this is a good opportunity for us to get in front of it. It seems like for, for quite some time, the security professionals were the ones that were trying to keep the enterprise from going to the cloud, which may have been what drove everybody underground anyway for shadow IT. So I think we now have an opportunity, like you said, you know, get in front of it and, uh, and make the best of it. I want to switch, mm -hmm. though, from kind of uh, the, the, the architectural implementation, shall we say, and kind of okay. get into to some of the, the other elements. Specifically, I want to dive into the identity side and then the data side. And we'll start with identity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned the integration of multi-factor authentication, and, and I think your slide said multi-factor for high risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Connection types, profiles, I'm not sure exactly what you, where you guys draw that line for high risk, but are, are we starting to talk about the CASB being able to provide some degree of step up authentication or or conditional access that maybe I have the, the granularity here to allow 
certain types of data, say, to move back and forth between a BIOD device and certain types not to, and you're, you're giving us that level of, of sophistication and control already? Yeah, I mean, so for the number one thing, a lot of large enterprises have their own identity providers um, in play, right? They may have multi-factor auth, all that. And, and what BitGlass says is we actually adhere to that. So while we're in the path, we're going to respect um, the the bit of uh, second factor, multi-factor. So, yeah, I'm not going to say CASBs are crossing into that realm, but they will provide that type of uh, functionality. So while adhering to your service provider, um, uh, being able to authenticate anywhere, as you do log in through the single sign-on, um, we will recognize based on location, hey, that person is not, you know, in, in a 30-minute realm, as I like to explain. It's physically impossible to get from one place to the other. Go ahead and uh, allow a multi-factor, but not through a big glass, but through the actual service provider. So because we're in the path at that point, and I can go more into the weeds, you know, if you guys want to take a, another demo with us uh, about how we're accomplishing that, I think CASBs are going to stop at that realm, but provide that security because it's important. I mean, you know, you don't want to have uh, malicious actors being able to access your content, and you want to have some visibility into that. So while we can provide that, um, we are still going to adhere to the service provider to actually presenting that multi-factor, but we can kind of, quote, force that approach. Okay. Okay. So, so you're, the, uh, you're kind of the detection and the trigger point there, but we can still rely upon and leverage the existing tools uh, that we Correct. already have made, made a substantial investment in, and, and some of the players uh, that you've described earlier, uh, some of those investments I'm sure are quite large, both in, in time and dollars. Uh, as you continue to see CASBs evolve, um, and, and you mentioned the use case of that somebody is, is logging in from, for example, uh, two disparate locations, mm -hmm. that brings to mind, again, kind of that, that sophistication of reporting. So when we start to talk about some of these user actions, while you're triggering on these events, maybe driving to authentication and authorization mechanisms housed mm -hmm. elsewhere, what kind of reporting are you finding that your customers are driving out of a solution like yours? Okay, great question. So I always like to promote our own reporting because I feel it's, it's pretty extensive. We're going to give you a record of anything that that is, uh, quote, sanctioned and, and being able to be proxied through us. Now, that being said, in a realistic world, you know, customers have a lot of third-party vendors that do these types of things like SIM tools. So all of our reporting can, can pipe over a RESTful API to a SIM. Okay, so that's number one for more advanced query and or reporting capabilities. But we are going to keep a record of every single event, right? What I mean by that is we're down to the request level. So if customers are clicking on certain links, that type of information is going to be logged, which may come handy like applications like Salesforce. Right, understanding if people are clicking on a certain contact or an opportunity, if you need that level of granularity, BitGlass can actually do that upon each request. And so, hmm. uh, yeah, so it's a very unique tool that way. And we can also invoke policy on a request. Uh, a, a use case that's been brought up, and I'll get back to the reporting, I'm not going to do too much of a tangent, is let's say I'm in my office and then I just, I keep my laptop on, but I just go to Starbucks, right? That time on a completely different network, outside of the office, at the point of the next request, or if I'm just clicking on the next email, we can actually prevent um, usage of the application, the service provider at that time, right? So very granular control um, on the request level, and then we're also reporting on that request level. So scaling it back to the original question, we do have robust reporting, but we can also integrate with your SIM tools. No, that's great for giving that kind of real-time awareness, uh, both in the cloud space across multiple providers and on-prem. So I think that's, that's fantastic. Glad you guys have, uh, have worked towards that. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left uh, here in this first session, so I want to switch gears before we run out of time and head over into the data component. You talked a lot about uh, the DLP uh, integrations. We had a few, few questions come in. Uh, regarding that, uh, one of them I, th I thought was kind of interesting because we know that DLP can sometimes be difficult to implement. It can take a long time to get your policies right. Uh, how long does it take to migrate from existing, you know, kind of traditional DLP on-prem to integrating with a CASB solution such as yours? Okay, so like, kind of, what, like what's I that think. process kind of look like? Yeah, no problem. So you know, what I talked about before with one of our uh, 
larger customers in is there's a couple of ways, right? You know, one is obviously creating them from scratch, which could could take hours, which we're not going to recommend only for small organizations because it's very flexible to create the patterns. The second way is just importing them, right? We can work with your team. We have a tool, or you can import an XML file to us, which we will uh, import in our um, in our tool, and then the, you will have your patterns uh, available for usage. So again, the um, process is going to be working with your DLP team to just export and import those patterns into our organization. So we have tools that support that, um, and we are willing to uh, assist in any way there. So it's an export and import from your current DLP solution. And is that, is that process, I mean, you make it sound like it's just control C, control V there to some degree. Um, so so it's, it's going to extend your existing pattern library over is there anything that, that happens at a more programmatic level, or is that something that's got to be a recurring um, process to keep it up to date? Yeah, I think I think what will happen is, you know, of course you can do the control C, control V, right? But that's kind of a little more manual. I think sure. what we're doing is we're uh, doing a, a one-time import, right, of, of current rules, and then going forward, you would just create new rules within our solution. So mm -hmm. um, it's not something because because that current DLP can be used for other solutions. Ours is particularly in the cloud. So we would kind of encourage you to work with us. That being said, you know, without giving up too inf much information, we do have one customer that is doing it programmatically. So it is possible. Okay, good to know. Now, now staying kind of on the on the topic of DLP, um, in your in your case study there with the Fortune 50 healthcare organization making the move to OneDrive. Was there any compelling reason not to leverage the existing DLP capabilities there? Was there something above and beyond that the, the organization was getting by introducing a CASB uh, solution into their mix? Yeah. Well, again, you know, traditionally Microsoft's DLP was meant more for outbound-based DLP over email, right? Outbound yep. or sent, right? So um, I don't – you know, know how they've done things today as we speak, you know, the 27th of October, but I know that their um, enforcement was really not meant for more download DLP, and that's what we're trying to really harness, coming down to any endpoint. So not only can we control the access, as I've talked about, but being able to invoke DLP down to any endpoint. So it was more of the their native capabilities with download-based DLP or DLP coming down to an endpoint versus outbound or send, which they've already established. So we can continue to say, hey, use your Microsoft for outbound-based emails or content, but when you want to really understand if data comes down to any device, that's where we really um, have the differentiator compared to what they're offering. No, that's, uh, that's a very good point on, uh, you know, two sides of that use case. You know, where you're talking about where the data kind of comes down to, um, I, I'm thinking back actually here just a couple of days ago, I was having some conversations uh, with my own legal counsel about e-discovery. Um, do you think that the CASBs are going to get into any sort of discovery and preservation as, a, uh, as another feature or capability, either through integrating with partners or in, in blocking or prohibiting certain types of actions? Is that, th is that a, a th you think, an area perhaps where this market will continue to mature towards? Um, that's actually a good question. You know, from what I've seen, I think not so much today. Um, you know, you got in the security uh, space. You know, there's so many vendors doing so many things. I think sometimes it's important to just kind of stay within your lane. So while we, of course, are are looking into other parts of integration points and functionality. I think today we are not. Um, do I see that in the future? It could be. I think it's more of a toss-up and to see where the industries want to drive us, right, our actual customer base. So I'm going to say sure. the short answer, I don't see it in the foreseeable future. Yep, good to know. Now I know what to uh, answer her back when she calls me again. I appreciate that. That was my own selfish question. Um, <laughs> no we do often have we often have a number of folks uh, on these events uh, from the government sector as well, and um, some folks are, are writing in about you know FedRAMP and these types of things. What impact does the introduction of a CASB solution have in uh, a, a federal organization's adoption of the cloud? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we are working with some government entities. We are, um, um, I, I don't know where we are in compliance with FedRAMP. I know that we should be on that short list. Again, I don't have all the factual information, so I'm not going to speak, you know, outside of that. But, you know, with government entities, it depends, right? If they want, we're, of course, we're a cloud-first based solution, right? We're completely distributed in AWS, but we do have customers that have on-premise deployments, right? So we're not opposed to um, uh, putting our, our software and our uh, service in their own cloud environment, right? So as government agencies uh, look to go out to the cloud, um, we're going to support them in the same way that we're supporting all our customers, right? Seamless, agentless, um, BYO-based approach. And the FedRAMP, again, is uh, something that we are in compliance of, I just don't know where we are in the in the I guess the application process. So, no, no, not at all. I was just wondering though if uh, if you're finding that the federal if the adoption of uh, technologies such as yours are are, are accelerating the the cloud uh, adoption. I got it. Okay, okay, I get it now. I get it now. Um, yep, uh, yep. Yeah, I would say I would say yes. I would say absolutely right because you know, people the, most folks that are that are. And let's face it, guys, you know, even though the cloud is sexy and it's here, you'd be surprised, or I'm always surprised, how many folks have not gone to the cloud, right? So um, it, it does help facilitate that move, right, now that they know that there is our security solutions in place to help them alleviate the risk for going to cloud applications. So in a, in a short answer, yeah, I, I definitely think it's going to help facilitate the move to the cloud. No, very good, very good. And by the way, thanks for uh, letting us know that you're moving towards that FedRAMP certification. Uh, we'll maybe uh, look to uh, get that question answered more definitively on a timeline coming up in parts two or three. Folks, keep keep the questions uh, and the dialogue coming. This is uh, this has been fantastic. I want to I want to ask you. Uh, we've just got a few more minutes left, so maybe take uh, one or two more questions. But give us a, a thought here. You know, I touched on e-discovery, legal hold. We talked about you know the the FedRAMP component. But if you're going to look into your crystal ball a little bit, polish that thing up, take a keen keen look in that, what do you think the next 12 to 18 months is going to bring uh, in the CASB space? Not necessarily product specific, but what types of things are you looking at from uh, capabilities that perhaps we can unlock or we can look forward to in a broad sense? I mean, I think it's just more, I think it's going to, it opens up more cloud adoption, right? I think, um, you know, folks are going to go from one service provider to two to ten, right? I think that, that's what CASBs do uh, for that. As far as, you know, I just want to be clear with e-discovery and legal hold, just kind of going back to that real quick. Most CASBs are not storing any data, right? Think of us as secure tunnels, right, or just providing uh, pertinent login information for you to react upon, right, um, or, or invoking policy to that content, right? So nothing stored, right? So. Um, that's something that's beneficial because people worried, hey, it's already stored in one cloud, or it's going to be stored in another. No, it's not. CASB will not store information. But as far as you know, 12 to 18 months, I think just adoption of cloud is what it's supporting. So people are more comfortable uh, going to cloud applications and knowing that CASBs can secure them in the manner that they are. Right. So again, it's not sure. like you mentioned; it's not a product or functionality thing. I think it just becomes more awareness to saying. You know, there are security solutions which are mature to be able to secure my adoption to the cloud. You made a comment there about uh, increasing speed and adoption going from, you know, 2 to 10. Do you think also perhaps that, that the visibility that a technology like this gives an enterprise, that this helps them actually rationalize, maybe rationalize down from 10 to 2 because it's, it's going to highlight areas where they may have some overlap in capabilities, you know, OneDrive versus Box versus Dropbox, for example. Yeah, I mean, maybe no, there, there could be some cost benefits. That's a good. That's a good point. Um, you know, I've seen people use all three, uh, three or four applications because you have large organizations that are maybe the marketing team is comfortable using one service provider, or the finance team is comfortable using another. So while they can scale down and say, no, we only have one all. Um, the cloud, again, is there to empower the user. So it gives the flexibility of saying, okay, yes, you can use this. We don't have to sanction this. It comes out of your budget, right? But knowing that there's a CASB overlaying all the applications does give that ability to continue to move further. And so that's how I see it, and that's how I have been seeing it. 
um, within current customers and prospects that I work with. Fantastic. Thanks, guys, uh, for, for coming out and putting this series together for us. I'm, I'm sure the audience, either live or on the archive, really appreciates uh, big glass of support. And uh, I think there's an exciting uh, uh, opportunity as cloud adoption continues to accelerate. It's, and it's, been, a, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on, but unfortunately, i got to let you get back to work because uh, you and I are out of time. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Appreciate it. Be happy to answer any questions going forward. You bet. Thank you, folks, and uh, look forward for parts two and three. We've got links to go ahead and register for those over in the attachments and links section. But until then, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Take care, all.